Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you, Matthew. I hope uh, there's someone uh, alive out there. <laughs> Uh, and at the same time uh, exhausted, so I can, because I think this will be some point of philosophical discussion about how, how we should screen or use PSA. And uh, I guess we can use another one or two hours discussing this, but I will try to give you my personal view in this. And as been said many times before, prostate cancer screening with PSA is a balance between the benefits and harms. And the results which have been pre presented today, uh, we can, have seen a rather modest effect on the prostate cancer mortality reduction, but we also know there is a considerable overdiagnosis. So what is important for improving this? Should we try to reduce the rate of overdiagnosis or should we try to increase the curability to improve the effect of screening? And could we you, it, it, obtain both? Both reduce overdiagnosis, but still incurs, cure, the, um, increase the curability. Despite we have screening, we now and then see this type of patients. This is a patient who actually was not a patient from the beginning, but he was participating in the Gothenburg screening study. And this was the first round, a low PSA increasing, and he was diagnosed at his fourth round with a PSA of 4.2. And despite this rather low PSA and a rather advanced prostate cancer with 10% grade five, and despite treatment, he died 10 years after the diagnosis. Uh, so our screening program, which is thought to be rather intensive, still miss this man. We do not know whether if we have found him at this stage, maybe at this stage, we have been able to cure him. Maybe he was incurable already here. We do not really know. But we know that some cancers are still missed. And we can look on the PLCU trial the other way around. Despite they had their screening, 150 men have actually died from prostate cancer, despite their screening program. Is it good or is it bad? But we know, and I usually try to say that prostate cancer should not be detected as early as possible, but as late as possible, <laughs> but while it still is curable. And how can we do that? We can ask ourselves, for whom should a screening program be designed for? And I think it's very important that a screening program must be that intense that it diagnoses these potentially lethal cancers early enough. A program that is not aggressive enough may miss these potentially lethal cancers, but still detect those harmless cancers. So they we have, will have all the harms with the screening, but we will have very little positive things from, from the screening. And we used to think that we can have a screening interval which is quite long because the lead time in prostate cancer is probably in five to 10 years. But that is only true if we discuss all cancers. We are only interested of those 25% of cancers that will kill the patients eventually. So we have to adapt a screening program that is designed for those 25% of men. Those we need to find, otherwise we should not screen at all. And the lead time in this group, I think, is in the range two to three years, approximately as in breast cancer. So what is important for overdiagnosis, and how could we uh, try to avoid that as much as possible. And this is a study from Gothenburg, which has just been submitted, but it was put in an abstract and presented last year at the, the EAU. And this was to look uh, in the Gothenburg study, we looked on those men who, uh, in different age cohorts, because those men who were born uh, 30 to 31, they were invited only three times, while oh, the, these men were invited four times 
this group five times, and so on. So we had all these men uh, terminated their screening at the age of 70, but they have been tested at very diff um, different many times. So when we look on this, we can see that this is these men who have been only been tested three times, while this is the, the group who have been invited at least seven times. And you can see two very interesting things here. First, age. Look here. This group was started at age of 55. When they were 60 years, they have been invited three times. The rate of prostate cancer detection is 4%. When at age of 65, it's doubled to 8%. And if at age of 70, it's doubled once again. It's 16% cumulative uh, uh, prostate cancer incidence. So age is enormously important to the cumulative risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer. But it looks as the number of time men have been screened not is so important. It's a bit more complicated because these three groups, here we had lowered the PSA cutoff uh, from 3 to 2.5. And you see these three is up here and these two are down here. So the conclusion we made from this is that the most important factor determining the cumulative incident uh, is age. And I think the age when we terminate screening is a very important factor for the risk of overdiagnosis. Uh, both you increase the cancer incidence and you decrease the, the remaining life expectancy. So, what about the intensity of the screening protocol? And I made here three uh, tentative screening programs. And in the first one is the, the situation we had before we had PSA. And as you can see, at that time we had a lifetime risk of having prostate cancer of three, about 10%. The lifetime risk of dying from prostate cancer was about 3%. If we have a low intense screening with a 20% mortality reduction, we will find approximately 16%. We will increase from 10 to 16% the lifetime risk. If we instead have a very intense program, we will increase this somewhat, but not that very much according to the data we have but we will decrease the mortality from 2.4 to 1.5. And if we look on the number needed to screen, and we have this as the background or control group, you can see the number needed to, sorry, number needed to, to diagnose will be much lower in the intense screening program compared to the low intense screening program. So these are interacting with each other. So we should not just focus on overdiagnosis, we also have to look on the effect of the screening program. And if we look again, as I started, and on the last publication coming out today on the ERSBC, you can see these very huge differences in relative risk reduction between centers. But if you look on the rate of incidence it, the incidence rate between the screening group and the control group, you can see in the Netherlands, it's 2.23 more men have been, have been diagnosed in the screening group compared to the control group. But if you look on the different centers, there is really no relation between this rate and the effect, which I think is very interesting. And I think we have some of the explanation here. We do not know what is important, if it's the screening interval, which I personally think is the most important thing, why Sweden has such much better effect. I think four years is much too long for finding these little cancers we ha which we have to find. But we have to prove that we don't know. Also, the PSA cutoff, I don't know what is important or the age group. But there are differences, and this will be a focus of the research within the ERSBC for the coming years. And also, uh, you can look on the depth in the last publication now of those in the screening arm. Half were among the screen detected, 
but one quarter of the death in the screening arm was due to interval cancers, which is rather high, and one quarter was among non-attendees. If you look on this, 25% death in the screening group due to interval cancers, you can see we did the same published in cancer a few years ago, and you can see among 39 can deaths in prostate cancer in Gothenburg, only three were interval cancers. So it's only 10% in Gothenburg, and it's 25% in the whole of ERSBC, telling us a lot of things. So if we turn the other way around, how to reduce overdiagnosis? The problem with PSA is the low specificity has been discussed. And it's many men with PSA elevation have that due to other causes and will be biopsied despite this and leading to that some small insignificant cancers are detected. If we use other clinical data such as family history, DRE and trust and use other markers and imaging techniques as we discussed, we find risk modifiers which we probably will use much more in the future to reduce the risk of overdiagnosis. I just show you this one. We, we have been testing together with Hans Lilja, and uh, oh no, sorry, this is just showing that PSA is still a very good test, and it could uh, risk stratify men just by a single PSA. So PSA is still something I think we should use, and we should definitely use it for individualizing the screening intervals. I think also this is interesting. We discussed new markers, but we have markers. And this panel of four calicarines, uh, which have been now tested in several uh, populations, uh, apart from Gothenburg, where it was tested for the first time. And these markers is that we use not only PSA, we use free PSA, intact PSA, and HK2. And by doing that, you can see if we use this together with clinical data, we can reduce the number of biopsies from 740 down to 297 and still detect 39 out of 40 high-grade cancers. And I think this could be very useful to use. I don't think many uses it, but I think we need to do this. So, uh, the future use, I think, will we <coughs> should use these risk modifiers, but we should use this intelligently. We, I think we should combine it with a lower threshold of PSA. With these panels, maybe we should use MRI and so on. And then we maybe could get a better sensitivity, higher cure rate, and also achieve a better specificity, and thereby lower the risk of overdiagnosis. So, to summarize this, to avoid overdiagnosis, avoid testing older men. That is the largest risk. And then no data support any benefit at this moment. I think we should use PSA, clinical data, and or a combination of calicarines for defining those who need biopsies, to decrease the number of men who need biopsies. And I think, I not discussed that, we have to use a reasonable number of course when biopsy and in my view, it's somewhere between 10 and 16. And I hope in the future, MRI and other imaging techniques may be helpful to select men with a positive screening test, uh, but more studies are needed. MRI are not that perfect uh, proven yet. And how to diagnose early enough? Those with a positive screening test should have a confirmatory biopsy. No PSA civilians. Many men with rather low PSA have rather advanced cancers and they will not benefit from PSA surveillance. I think use individual screening interval based on PSA. Do not use the too long screening interval if you want to screen patients with uh, uh, rather finding them early enough. And maybe we should lower a PSA cutoff, maybe 1.5, maybe 2, supplemented by other risk modifiers to have a better screening program. And remember, a man wants to PSA, PSA test not to find the cancer early enough. He wants the PSA test to confirm that he is healthy. He has a very a different input to this. It's a reassurance. 
So in my view, if a man asks for PSA, PSA testing, he should follow an organized program. I think still it's better, even if it's not true. And uh, if he's not doing that, I think it's a risk, at least as it's carried out here in Europe, that we do more harm than benefit. Thank you. Thank you, no Jonas. Discussion. I hope they are exhausted. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank uh, everybody to stay uh, so for a long time.